My name is Jan Elring. Uh, today we are going to look at the Azure functions in a hybrid world. Uh, Partial Conf EU uh, sponsors this year. Uh, the agenda for this session is to understand how Azure functions differ from other automation capabilities in Azure. So mainly we're going to compare it to Azure Automation. Uh, then we're going to learn how to leverage Azure functions for hybrid uh, management, specifically uh, looking into the details of uh, secrets management and uh, remoting. So before we dig into the demos, I just wanted to do a brief introduction to, to the different automation capabilities we have in Azure. So uh, I suppose most of you uh, who have been at the PSConf EU before and have worked a lot with PowerShell are familiar with Azure Automation. So this has traditionally been the automation capability in Azure where we can store uh, PowerShell scripts uh, as uh, so-called runbooks. A runbook is basically a PowerShell script, but you can also uh, benefit from features such as uh, retrieving uh, global variables such as for uh, SMTP servers or any variable you want to retrieve globally uh, secrets. So in Azure Automation, there is uh, the possibility to store usernames and passwords and connection information. Uh, those are seamlessly stored encrypted in uh, a key vault, but that is something that is just handled for us. This is a platform as a service uh, offering. Uh, then we have a lot of different uh, related uh, automation capabilities, for example, Resource Manager, which is the, the core infrastructure as a code uh, feature in Azure. So you can use uh, ARM templates to deploy uh, resources in Azure. Uh, we have event grid, which can tie things together. For example, when a new virtual machine is created, an event grid can be configured to, for example, call an Azure automation runbook or call an Azure function, for example, to trigger some action. Uh, then we have Azure Functions, which we're going to talk about uh, more in details in this session. And uh, on the right hand side, we have uh, Logic Apps, which is kind of a, a visual uh, workflow uh, engine. Where it's very similar to uh, services like uh, If This Then That, and also the new uh, Power Automate, which is basically running on the same workflow engine, uh, where you can have integrations or there are connect connectors to, uh, I think it's hundreds of several uh, integrations basically. So for example, FTP servers, Dropbox, you can trigger an event, for example, when a new file is landing in a button drive or, and then you can do uh, other actions such as call a function or call our automation runbook and so on. So this is kind of the overall uh, core capabilities that we, we uh, have in our tool belt. So uh, like myself, I suppose most of you have been working with Azure Automation, but uh, Azure Functions, as you know, is uh, the new new uh, guy in town, which we are going to talk about it in this session. So the uh, one of the core benefits of using these services is that you get the full abstraction of servers. Uh, as a developer or a script developer, so to speak, you can just focus on your code. There are no distractions around server management, capacity planning or availability. Uh, it, it's a serverless offering, basically. Uh, it's also instant event-driven scalability, uh, so application components can react to events and triggers in their real time with virtually unlimited scalability because compute resources are used uh, as needed, basically. Uh, so in the, uh, in the list of services that you can see on the screen now, uh, Azure Automation Hybrid Runbook Workers is an exception. So because that is running on a server that you as the customer manage, so this has been historically used as the primary way of automating against on-prem environments from, from Azure or from Azure Automation. So it's basically an agent that you install on the on-prem machine. Uh, it's supported on both Linux and Windows. So the Microsoft monitoring agent, which you can then uh, onboard and register as a hybrid runbook worker. So basically when you start a runbook, uh, you have the option to either start it in a sandbox environment in Azure, which is basically 
They're probably running in some kind of container which only have internet access so we can do automation against anything can, which can be read from the internet such as your Azure environment and so on. But if you want to reach a on-premise environment, for example, a local uh, database server or Active Directory or a file server or whatever that you want to automate on-premise, uh, the, the option have been to use the hybrid runbook worker option. So we're going to have a look at uh, how we can get similar features or similar functionality for on-prem management in, uh, in functions in this session. So if we first start with uh, comparing the two, uh, so Azure Automation currently supports only Windows PowerShell. Uh, it's uncertain whether this will change or not. Uh, it's been our requested feature for, for quite some time, uh, but I don't have any information on that uh, matter. Uh, so Azure Automation might be easier for the traditional IT pro because it's uh, uh, you have everything basically in uh, in uh, one service where you define variables and define credentials and all the things I mentioned before, while in functions there is kind of a different way of thinking basically. So uh, I will get uh, get back to that. Um, so Azure Functions, if we talk about the main the main differences, is that Azure Functions user use uh, PowerShell Core or PowerShell Seven as the latest version is called while Azure Automation still uses Windows PowerShell. And as you know, uh, Windows PowerShell is deprecated. Uh, version 5.1 is the last last uh, version. So uh, it will continue to, to be supported and uh, it will be provided security fixes and so on. But all new features will go into PowerShell Core or PowerShell 7. So. Uh, it might make sense uh, if we think about the long run to go into uh, the PowerShell core or PowerShell 7 route, which is basically at this point uh, in May 2020, where when this was recorded, uh, Azure Functions. So here you can see the, as you've see, probably seen before uh, in the sessions about PowerShell core or PowerShell 7, uh, the differences, for example, that uh, we have support for not only Windows Remote Management or VSMAN remoting as we used to, but also SSH. Uh, it's based on .NET Core, so it can run on Linux and Mac in addition to Windows. So uh, it's more lightweight and there have been quite a lot of uh, new features in uh, PowerShell 7 since, since PowerShell was ported basically to, to .NET Core. So this is uh, one of the primary uh, decision factors or reasons I suppose to start considering using Azure Functions going forward. So I, I don't think it's any, there aren't any reason to just convert to run books from Azure Automation into functions. Uh, things that works uh, it's, uh, can just continue to, to work, but uh, when you think about new, developing new features or new business processes that you want to, to accomplish, I would rec recommend at least considering Azure Functions because of all the, the reasons I just mentioned here. I also mentioned that uh, Azure Functions is kind of a new way of uh, thinking or it opens up for new ways of thinking. So if you have a quick look at the Azure Functions programming model before we dig into the demos. Uh, so everything is uh, based on events in Azure Functions. So for example, it can react to timers. Uh, so you can, for example, set up a schedule as you can in Azure Automation. You can schedule a run book to run every morning at 6 a.m. to send you a report of the backups or whatever. You can do the same thing here. Uh, it's also a little bit uh, um, different because the scheduling feature here is using a cron tab expression, so it's more more uh, if you're used to Linux, uh, that is something you will handle. But for those who are coming from a Windows background, uh, it might be might uh, take some time to getting used to. It's kind of getting from Windows to, to Linux, Linux on that uh, side of things, I suppose. Uh, then we have HTTP triggers. So you can basically, this is the most common trigger to just uh, have a HTTP endpoint, basically, that you trigger with some authorization code in order to, to trigger or your function to start. Or there are a lot of uh, triggers or event handlers from different Azure services, for example, Azure 
storage blob storage so whenever a new blob is written it can it can call a function basically so there are a lot of options there but i think http which is basically a webhook uh, similar to webhooks in azure automation it's uh, one of the uh, main uh, uh, triggers or events to use in addition to, to scheduling uh, then you have of course the code so in this scenario it is PowerShell that we're going to talk about but for developers software developers there are also a lot of languages that you can write the serverless code in basically and then you have this notion of an output so the result can be sent to different uh, outputs for example when talking about the HTTP triggers you can uh, push the output to the what is called an HTTP binding so basically you send a HTTP code for example uh, uh, code 200 for success or five, uh, five, 500 for internal server error for example uh, back to the client that is sending the request but there are also different uh, other outputs for example uh, sending it to a, a queue or a database or yeah, all of these are are available in the documentation for Azure Functions. So the main topic for this session is uh, hybrid management. So there we have basically two uh, options. So the first one is uh, very similar to the Azure Automation hybrid worker uh, approach that I talked about earlier. So um, <coughs> it's... Uh, it's based on uh, a service in Azure and uh, a feature in Azure App Service. So if you don't know, uh, Azure App Service is basically a platform as a service for hosting uh, websites. Uh, so, you, it's, so you don't have to manage any VMs or servers. You can just bring your web application and have it hosted in Azure App Service. So Azure Functions is actually built on top of Azure App Service. So that's why you are going to see that a lot of the same features in uh, in uh, Azure App Service is also available in Azure Functions. So hybrid connections is one of them. So this is uh, um, the topology. So basically have the web application uh, or the function app in our case. Uh, then you have the hybrid connection, which is basically a, a pointer to a hybrid connection manager or an agent that you install on an on-premise server. So this is only supported on Windows, so you have to install it on a Windows operating system or, for example, uh, running in your on-premise environment if you want to reach an endpoint, for example, uh, a database, as you can see in this picture, but in our case, uh, the endpoint will be typically a PowerShell remoting endpoint. So within uh, App Service, the hybrid connections can be used to access application resources in the network that the agent is running inside of. Um, so it uh, it creates or correlates to a single TCP host and port combination. So it means that the hybrid connection endpoint can be on uh, any operating system and any appli application, provided that you're accessing a TCP listening port. So the hybrid connection features it. It's basically running on layer four in the TCP in the in the TCP networking stack. So it does not know or care what application protocol it is. For example, whether it's uh, HTTP or SSH or whatever it is, it's simply providing network access. So this is the first option we're going to look at in the demos. Uh, the next option is something called the virtual network integration. So here you can basically integrate your function or app service where the function is hosted inside of your Azure virtual network. Um, so this is part of the Azure functions premium plan, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the elastic premium plan. Uh, th that's a hosting option for function apps because you have different SKUs when you're creating a function. We're going to look into this in the portal but uh, uh, the premium plan provides features like uh, the vnet connectivity that we are talking about here uh, it also provides no cold start uh, and premium hardware so for example when you're using the consumption plan uh, which is the serverless or the cheapest option basically where you just pay for each run 
uh, if you don't use the function for a certain amount of time, uh, you will get a so-called cold start, and then it can take uh, a few seconds before the the function is called or responds, basically. But if you're using the premium SKU, you can avoid the cold starts. It will always be running on at least one instance, so it will be ready to serve requests. So it's possible to host multiple function apps on the same premium plan. So you can buy one premium plan and have different function apps for different scenarios. For example, one for automation against the Active Directory, one against uh, your virtualization environment and so on. Uh, that's just a couple of examples. So the Azure function deployment to the premium plan that takes advantage of the new VNet integration for web applications in app service. So when it's configured, your application can communicate with resources within your VNet. Um, so when assigning a subnet to your function app in a premium plan, you need a subnet with enough IP addresses for each potential instance. So it's required that you have a subnet available when you enable this feature with at least 100 available addresses. So I would recommend to just create a dedicated subnet for uh, Azure Functions and uh, make it just a slash 24, for example, so we have uh, enough addresses for integrations there. The feature is very easy to set up, but it doesn't mean that the experience will be problem free. So there are, of course, uh, some utilities that you can use to test connectivity from the app console in the portal that I will show you. So if you want to reach your on-premise environment using this approach, you have to connect your Azure virtual network uh, to the on-premise environment using either a traditional VPN uh, tunnel, so we typically provision a VPN gateway in Azure and configure a regular site-to-site -site tunnel to your on-premise data center, or you can also use Express Route, which is kind of a, a faster and more reliable uh, networking option where the traffic doesn't traverse the internet, it's dedicated uh, it's running in a dedicated pipe between your uh, service provider, your ISP basically, and the Azure environment. So those are the op options for uh, integrating into the VNet. So that's enough background. Uh, let's dig into the demos. So let's start with the, the basics. For uh, uh, those who haven't played with functions before, I just wanted to briefly mention how to get started. So here, uh, as you know, uh, Virtual Studio Code is the preferred uh, environment or editor environment at least for for uh, Azure Functions or PowerShell 7 at least. So it's the same for PowerShell uh, or for uh, using PowerShell in Azure Functions. So uh, the prerequisites listed here, as you probably know, install the latest version of PowerShell 7, which is 7.01 at uh, this point, May 2020. You also need the .NET Core SDK, uh, and you need the Azure Functions Core Tools. Uh, all of these are available in, uh, in the documentation, so you can just uh, download them from there. You would, of course, also need a Azure subscription that you can publish. You need to create a function app and publish your Azure Functions to. So I've also provided some links to the documentation here, for example, on the introduction to functions, so some overview here, you can see more details about the different triggers that I was talking about and the different uh, options for responding to events from event grid and uh, service bus and all of those things. The different plans, for example, the consumption plan, which is the cheapest one. Uh, we only pay for the time your code runs. Uh, the premium plan that we need in this case, where we are going to use the VNet integration. Uh, you also have uh, a developer's guide. So there is a specific uh, article for PowerShell developers, basically. So here you have all the information you need to get started. Uh, at the right hand side, here you can see uh, the topics, so it will explain all of the basics you need to get started. For uh, for example, the folder structure. So when you create, you initialize a project that we're going to do now, it will create this folder structure for you. And here it will explain uh, the different, uh, different uh, files and folders, basically. 
So let's get started with uh, going into our demo folder, uh, create a new function. Uh, let's just remove the one that is here. Yes, the folder is already empty, so uh, let's just uh, proceed. Uh, go into the folder, and uh, this is the command for manually initializing a new uh, function using uh, PowerShell as the runtime. So let's go ahead and run it. And then you can see that it will create the folder structure that was referenced in the documentation. Uh, so this is basically creating, initializing a new project for us, for a new Azure function. Then we are going to create a new uh, function inside of the project, which is uh, going to be running, of course, PowerShell. As the trigger, we are going to use the HTTP trigger, and we just give it a, a name. And after we run this command, it will also create, it will basically create a new uh, folder inside of this folder structure with the, with the, the new function. So if we go and look at the folder structure here, you can see that uh, my HTTP trigger contains this function.json file for specifying settings and run.ps1, which is basically the, the main function or the main uh, PowerShell file that the, our code is going to live inside of. So here you can see from the documentation as our reference, uh, the different files. <coughs> So for example, the uh, host.json, which contains some global configuration options. So we can actually go ahead and add that folder to our workspace here. So we can have a quick look. Uh, so here is the new thing, new structure that we just created. So host.json, um, here I haven't uh, used any customization. I've just been using it as is. Some local settings for uh, specifying local dev uh, development settings. Profile.ps1, so this is something that will run on every cold start of your function app. So that is, for example, in a consumption plan, if it's not used in a certain amount of time, or when it starts up uh, for the first time, or when you, for example, restart it, when you deploy, deploy a new version, for example, and it needs to restart, uh, the profile will run run again. This is by default uh, populated with the uh, uh, connect AC account so it will use something called managed identity to authorize itself to, to Azure if you are going to do some automation against Azure. So it's fine to just leave this on because it will on only be called if uh, MSI secret is defined so that's basically when managed identity is enabled for the function. We're going to look in, into this later on. Then we have requirements. So by default, the Azure, the Azure modules are defined here. Um, this takes some time to download. So I would recommend to just uh, remove this one and rather, I think I have a reference here, um, rather specify only the ones you need. So in this case, we are going to use AC accounts, which is needed for connect uh, AC account and AC key vault, which we are going to do some um, operations against for retrieving uh, for retrieving secrets. So let's just uh, add only the ones we need, so it will be much faster basically to, to initialize. Something with the IntelliSense here, but I, I think it's fine. Uh, Next, uh, if we have a look at the function that we created, so here you can create uh, multiple functions inside of the same function project. So in this case, we only have one, but if you create additional ones, it will create this structure or a folder with this structure for all of them. So here are the settings for the function, uh, basically defining the, the bindings, it should be a trigger as I chose. And then you have run.ps1, which is basically the, uh, the function itself. So here it's also some bo boilerplate code just to show you how it works. So for example, it uh, 
checks if the incoming requests uh, have this name parameter specified and if it does it will just uh, return the HTTP status code OK and respond with a hello and if that is missing it will just return a bad request and uh, spe specify this body and then we have this built-in push output binding command which is the, which can be called to basically reply to the caller so you send the status code and the body back to the caller so the thing that we put inside of this one is uh, this uh, command is the response you will get uh, back so let's just go ahead and run this one uh, we can go ahead and start it locally just for testing so that's the great thing about functions that you can just go ahead and run them and troubleshoot them and debug them on your local system uh, without calling them or even publishing them Uh, one thing I wanted to add before we start is this one. So we can basically if we go into the run file again and in the status we add this string to the body so it, we can also see what PowerShell version we are running from. So now that the function have started, we can go ahead and uh, call it uh, from the local host on this port, which by default is it will start on 7071. So here we can see in the terminal that the function is now running. So let's just head to a different terminal window to run invoke rest method against the local endpoint. So now we can see that it returned the string with a parameter that I supplied here. And it also replies with the PowerShell version that is uh, uh, running on the host, which is basically localhost in my case. Uh, as you notice here, uh, the PowerShell version is 6.2.4. That's because uh, the Azure functions, or the Azure function PowerShell runtime is uh, is uh, still running on PowerShell Core 6, the latest version there. Uh, version 7 that is was released on github a few weeks ago but it hasn't been uh, deployed yet so it's not available in the service as far as i know uh, i think it's right around the corner when looking through github issues uh, someone mentioned sometime in mid-may so i think it's just around the corner so that's why we'll see 6.2.4 there um, Let's go ahead and actually connect to our Azure environment. So here I already run this command, con connect AC, and configure the correct context. So what subscription you are going to work against, because when you're connecting, you might have access to more than one subscription. So it's a good idea to configure the correct context. Uh, there was also recently uh, just a few days ago, uh, the version 1.0 of the Azure Functions PowerShell module. So you can actually now use uh, PowerShell to uh, manage your Azure Functions from PowerShell. Here we can see our commands for creating a new function app, creating a new app plan, for example, a premium plan that we're going to use, and start and stop, and uh, update settings, and, and so on. Uh, so let's go ahead and create a new resource group for this uh, demonstration. Uh, then we are also going to create an app plan because we are not going to use the consumption plan. We need the premium plan in our case because we are going to use the virtual network integration. So let's just go ahead and create that. Uh, while we wait for that, let's just dive into the portal and have a quick look at the uh, uh, now we can see that the resource group is not available, so it will be available soon. But let's have a quick look at uh, how to create a function. So you can basically search for a function app, uh, hit the add button. You can also search for it in the Azure Marketplace. Select a resource group, for example, a new one that we just created. Uh, we want to publish from code in our case, but it's also possible if you have a Docker container to publish that. Uh, for the runtime stack, we want to use PowerShell 
core, so that's PowerShell 6.2.4, as I mentioned. 7 will probably be available very soon. Uh, select your region where you want it to be hosted. So in my case, um, the Norway East uh, region is the closest one to me. Uh, and then just give it a name. Next, you have some hosting options. So when you chose uh, PowerShell as the runtime, the only operating system supported is Windows at this stage. I'm not sure if Linux will, it will probably be available at a later, later stage, but for now we have to run it on Linux. The function app also needs uh, an Azure storage account for persisting data. So you can either create a new one or point to an existing one. Uh, the plan in this case, uh, I'm going to use the premium plan as previously mentioned. The consumption plan isn't available in Norway yet. So if you want to use that, we can use, for example, West Europe. And then you also need to create this uh, plan. So that is what we are basically creating here, uh, the plan. And you can also choose what size you want. So for example, uh, Elastic Premium EP1, which will provide three and a half gigabyte of memory on the worker. So that is the capacity that your functions are going to share basically. Next for monitoring, uh, it's strongly recommended to enable uh, applications insights for the function so that you can get the uh, full visibility into logs. Uh, that's uh, something we can have a look at when the function is running. Uh, tags, that's just regular Azure tags. So I'm just going to cancel this one. I just wanted to show you the options graphically and continue creating it here. So here we are going to create a storage account needed for persistent storage. So I'm just creating a dedicated one for this Azure function. Then we're also going to create the application insights instance. Here you can have one application insights instance shared across multiple app, app services. But in this case, I'm just creating a new one dedicated for this Azure function app. And the last part is to create the actual uh, Azure function app. So we give it a name, resource group. Uh, the location is something that you don't specify when we are using uh, a hosted plan because the location is decided when creating, creating the hosted plan. So in this case, I'm just commenting it out because we're not using the consumption plan. Partial runtime. Uh, I actually tried to specify 7.0 as the runtime version. Uh, I believe it worked, so I'm just going to leave it there for now. Uh, the functions version, uh, version 3, which is basically running .NET Core 3 as far as I know. Uh, the plan that we created earlier, the storage account and application insights that we created earlier, and always type needs to be Windows as we saw earlier on. So let's just try to run this. Not sure if it will work with 7.0, but uh, we'll just see and change it to 6 if it fails. So now we can see it has been provisioned. And if we go back to the portal, you can also see the resource group where it provisioned the service plan, which is basically hosting or app service. Uh, application insights and the storage account. So if we look into the function app, here you can see the, uh, just a few weeks ago, I think uh, the new um, the new uh, design or for or the new graphical interface in the portal was released. So if you looked into functions before, uh, it had a more uh, classic view, so to speak. So this is the new modern modern one, which is much uh, faster. So for example, when you access your functions earlier, it could take some time, but now it uh, is more uh, more instant. Uh, so now we don't have any functions here, uh, but so we're going to get back into this afterwards when we are, uh, when you have published a function. So first you need to also log into the Azure CLI because the Azure function CLI is uh, using that for authentication. So that is also something that I have done before this demo. Uh, then we're going to run the func Azure function app publish command in order to publish our function app to the PowerShell function demo app that we created in Azure. So that is something you will have to create in advance like we did here with PowerShell.
But first let's go back to our integrated console and hit Control c to stop the local instance that we are testing against. Uh, then we are going to publish the current folder to the new function app that we created. So let's just go ahead and run this. And the next thing we are going to do when this has completed is that we are going to instead of call the local host endpoint, we are going to um, call the function endpoint inside of Azure. So we're going to use the code that we will get, an authorization code that is needed in order to call the function. You have the option to also configure Azure functions with the anonymous authentication, so you don't need the code, but of course that is something that is uh, recommended for production at least. And then you specify a new parameters with the uh, and ampersand and the name of the parameter and the value of the parameter at the end. So here you can just go ahead and grab the invoke URL directly from the output. And copy it in here. And we should be able to just go ahead and run it. Uh, so the first time we're calling it, it will be a so-called uh, so called cold start. So it will take some time. So here you can see that even though I specified 7.0 as the version, it is actually 6.2.4 6 that is still there. So this will probably change very soon, I hope. So if we go back into the portal, uh, we have a look if our new function is available here. So here it is, my HTTP trigger. So you can see that you can have multiple functions inside of one uh, app service or function app basically. So it's a common approach to try to group uh, common uh, functions together in one function app. So as I mentioned earlier on, for example, for automating against your virtualization environment, group those functions into one function app, for example, to keep things uh, logically organized. Let's go into the HTTP trigger and see how it looks like here. So here you can see that we can go into uh, monitor in order to see the output or the traces that's uh, going to be stored in application insights. So here it, uh, as it says here, the results can be delayed for up to five minutes. So it's not instant looking at this. This is great for looking into traces after something has been run, but if we are debugging or troubleshooting, it's more, it's faster to look into the logs. So let's go ahead and call it one more time. Then you can see it's uh, showing the output here. You can also go into the code and test button or option. Uh, and here you can hit the test button uh, we can add a parameter, so for example, name and uh, my name, and run it directly from the browser and see the output here. So here we will see both the logs and the HTTP response. All right, so this was uh, the basics. Uh, so let's get started with the main topic here, which is uh, uh, first of all, uh, hybrid connections, then we're going to look into the VNet integration and we're going to end with some uh, tips and tricks. So for the hybrid connections, uh, the first thing that we already done is to create a function app. Uh, next, you can use in VS Code, you have these extensions. So we have extensions for Azure account that you would need and also for Azure functions. So this is an extension you can install in order to get uh, this option here, uh, where you can see that uh, your function app will be uh, available. So you can, for example, publish uh, to it right from the extension here instead of using the CLI basically. So uh, let's close this one and uh, let's go ahead and create a new one. Uh, so let's go ahead and hit F1 and Azure functions, you can just search for Azure functions and create a new function from here. Here you can also see that we could have created a project from here. I just wanted to show you how to do it from the command line, but all of the things you can uh, do from the extension basically that is uh, more convenient. 
Uh, next, we're going to point to the folder where our function project lives. So that is cdemos, ps function project demo that we created earlier on. Uh, we also get the option to initialize it for use with code. So it will create a .vs code folder with some specific settings for code. Uh, next, we need to select a template. So let's go with the HTTP trigger again and give it a name. So HTTP trigger hybrid one. We want to use, in this case, the function authorization level. And then we get this boilerplate, which is basically the same as we had earlier on. Um, let's go ahead and uh, copy from my reference uh, the content. So here we have some boilerplate. So here we are setting, first of all, up the credential object for connecting to the remote machine. <coughs> So this admin password, that is something that is exposed if we go back to the function app and have a look at the configuration settings. Uh, then we have application settings. And here you can basically go ahead and create, let's just copy the correct one. the password you want. And when you hit the save button, the app will be restarted. So it will basically be a new cold start. So the settings that you insert here will basically be exposed as environment variables. So that's why we can just go ahead and uh, reference it like this and build a credential object uh, that we can use with, uh, with PowerShell remoting basically. Uh, next, before we start to remote into uh, our local endpoint, uh, we have to set up the, the hybrid connection. So when you go into networking under settings, you have this option for creating hybrid endpoints. Let's go ahead and uh, hit download connection manager. That will basically give you the link to the MSI installer. So this is something that I have already installed on a machine. So if we go into this one and uh, have a look in download. So here we have the connection manager, which is already installed. So we can go and open the connection manager UI. So this is from my previous uh, demo or dry run of this demo. So it's deleted. That's why it says it's not found. So let's just go ahead and create it create a new hybrid connection, uh, give it a name. So I'm just giving it the name of uh, the machine that uh, we are running this on. Uh, the port number is going to be 5986 because we are going to use PowerShell remoting over SSL. And then we're going to create a service bus namespace. I don't think that's available yet. So now it's created, so we can go back and select it in the hybrid connection manager. So it will show us not connected. Uh, so we will go ahead, need to go ahead and restart the service in order to have it connect. So now we can see it's connected. And if we go back to the portal and refresh here, we should also see it's connected here. So now it's basically defined with the partial remoting SSL port ready for use. So before we can go ahead and use uh, this endpoint, we will have to do uh, some additional steps. So now we have created the hybrid connection, we installed the agent, um, we created an app setting for the password of the admin account. Uh, then the on-premise server need to be enabled for partial remoting because from a function app, you don't have the option to, it's of course not joined to Active Directory, so you can't use Kerberos, and you also can't modify the trusted host property. Uh, so that's why we basically need to use HTTPS listeners uh, in order to use partial remoting. 
So first enable remoting as uh, usual. Uh, it's enabled as you know in 2012 and later. You have to create a firewall rule for HTTPS, uh, the default port. Uh, in the example in the documentation we are using self-signed certificates but you can of course use your own. And then create a WinRM listener for uh, HTTPS using that certificate. So this is something I've already run so if we go in inside of this uh, machine and have a quick look at the settings uh, listener you can see that it's already set up for listening on HTTPS then we can test the function so this is the skeleton that I already inserted basically uh, at least I think so no so let's just go ahead and insert this one So here we are connecting to the hybrid endpoint using the name. So when this name is specified, it is going to recognize it and automatically forward the request to the hybrid endpoint. Uh, here we have, this is just an example they have in the documentation. So we just get the, the status for a specific service. Uh, here I'm getting the input from the request. So the name that you're sending to the, as a parameter, it's the name of the service, so for example the spooler service. Uh, then we are using regular partial remoting, uh, invoke command, uh, the credential object with the administrator account, SSH, and of course we have to skip the CA check because we used a self-signed certificate. Um, and then we are just, uh, after we connected and stored the, the result in this output variable, we're just getting the status for the status property for the specific um, service. In this case, the, the spooler that I'm going to use as an example. And we're pushing back that to the response, basically. So let's go ahead and publish this one. Uh, we haven't published it yet, it, uh, it's only defined locally. So now we can see how we can do it from the extension. I go to Azure, uh, push this uh, deploy to function app. Then we have to select the folder we want to deploy. So this is the project folder. Then we have to choose the subscription we want to deploy to and the function app inside of that subscription. So now it's going to zip up this uh, folder and deploy it and here it asks me if I want to overwrite on the previous versions. So let's just go ahead. So when this finishes in a few seconds we will have this new uh, version available. A new function basically. Alright, so let's see if we refresh here. We can see the new one, HTTP trigger hybrid. Uh, we can choose to run it locally. So let me just go ahead and grab the function key. The default key is available here. And insert it here. I think this should be correct syntax. Just delete this one. Uh, yeah, so here we get, uh, get status for service spooler is running. So if we go ahead and just stop the spooler. And rerun the function, we would expect it to be stopped. So we can see that it's, it's working basically. So if we go into uh, the code and test, here we can see the code that we had locally. So in this case it uh, worked as it uh, was expected. So the command ran and it uh, returned the output in the output binding basically. Uh, so I think this is it for the hybrid connections. Uh, essentials is that it basically works like the Azure Automation hybrid worker. Uh, but you of course need to wrap your calls into 
into invoke command because the code is not running on the worker you have to use invoke command to invoke it basically uh, so let's go ahead and look at the next demonstration which is the virtual network integration yeah so this is something i mentioned earlier on uh, we also have the documentation for the premium plan here as a reference so you can dig more into all of the steps to how to create a function plan this is basically what we have already created uh, then you will need to enable the integration for the virtual network so this is something we are going to do right now we go into the same place as we configured the hybrid connections so instead of going to hybrid connections we are going to vnet integration uh, and here you can see that it's not integrated into any vnet yet so we're going to add the integration select a virtual network so this is a virtual network that i already had uh, inside of my environment so we can have a quick look at that how that works so if we search for virtual network So here I'm using my another space dedicated for this uh, virtual network. I'm using my on-premise domain controller, lab domain controller as the DNS server. And I have a number of virtual machines connected here. So here I also have a virtual network gateway connected. So this provides VPN connectivity to my on-premise uh, lab environment in this case, but it could be your data center. Uh, and if you look into subnets, here you can see that I have created this dedicated function subnet, which we are going to specify now. So different services in Azure, they typically require their own dedicated subnet. As you can see here, the gateway requires a dedicated subnet. Azure Bastion service requires a dedicated subnet and so on. So regular VMs I have in this subnet. Uh, function subnet is what we're going to choose now. Yeah, here it says that communicating with resources behind a service endpoint can take a few hours to take effect, but uh, at least in my experience, it works rather immediately. So there it's connected. Then we can go back and have a look at the demonstration. So if you go into the function app development tools on the console in the application uh, here, you have this console, browser-based console, here you can do some basic testing using some tools that's available. So for example, TCP ping. So here I'm pinging a IP address inside of the virtual network. And that is a Windows server with partial remoting enabled. So I'm just going to test if I can reach that. That looks good. So we have network connectivity. We can reach the virtual network from the application. Uh, then we also have this name resolver uh, utility. So for example, I can ping the name of my Active Directory lab domain. So you can see I got a response. I can check uh, for on-premise host names, for example, my Hyper-V host. And you can see that it uh, it works. So now I basically have uh, connectivity to my uh, virtual network and via the VPN gateway to my on-premise network. So I can also try the TCP ping command against an on-premise, for example, the Hyper-V server. This is running on a Hyper-V host in my basement, which have VPN connectivity to, uh, to Azure. And here you can see that I also have connectivity from the function app to my local Hyper-V server. So this is uh, some great tools to have to just do some basic verification after we have configured the VNet integration to see that the communication basically is working as expected. Next, we're going to create a new function app for demonstrating or testing this one. So 
this feature so let's just go ahead and create a new function uh, same folder ps function up in cdmos http trigger uh, hybrid 2 which is for the vnet demonstration and the function uh, function authorization and let's just go ahead and copy the code from my previous sample and have a look at what we are actually doing here so uh, first of all we are going to uh, let's go back to the vnet integration again insert a skeleton so that's basically what i did now uh, deploy it uh, let's just have a quick look at how it looks like so uh, first we are just going to um, to retrieve some secrets from the key vault so if we go back here and have a look at the, the configuration settings you recall that the password for the local administrator was stored here as a environment variable uh, in this case we are now going to connect to our linux vm actually so we are going to connect to the CentOS vm that is running on my hyper-v host uh, so then we are going to use a private RSA key instead of a username and password. So that's why I'm, <clears throat> I'm retrieving the RSA key from the key vault instead of uh, from an environment variable because it's too long so it can't be stored as a variable basically. Yes, yeah, so I was actually getting a little bit ahead of myself there. So before we do the Linux demo, we're just going to comment that out and do our regular VSMAN remoting to a Windows machine. So we're using the same technique as we did earlier on, but instead of connecting to the uh, this machine, which is basically being under the hood converted to the hybrid connection feature, I'm going to connect to a different machine that is running inside of the virtual network. So you can see it if we have a look at the connected devices in the virtual network. This machine, it's uh, available as a VM in Azure. So we're just going to connect to this one. So with that, this is a Windows server uh, with partial remoting enabled. And I also run the same commands as I showed earlier for enabling a self-signed certificate and SSL-based remoting. So this is the exact same uh, configuration basically. The only difference here is that I'm specifying configuration name PowerShell 701. Um, we don't have to do it, I just uh, do it to show how to connect to PowerShell 7, uh, basically. Uh, and here I'm writing hello from on the PowerShell version and the host name, basically. So we expect it to be connected to PowerShell 701 on this machine. So let's go ahead and, uh, and uh, publish this one. Uh, go to the Azure extension, function extension, and publish the function up again. Deploy. So it's completed. So let's go ahead and uh, get the function code. Key. Paste it here and try to run it. Uh, of course, I also need to specify the name for the parameter. So, name equals Jan, for example. And here you can see that there we got the remote response, hello, PowerShell version 701 from the hostname that we expected. So this uh, seems to be working uh, as expected, basically. It was using PowerShell remoting into a machine in this virtual network. Uh, let's just go ahead and change it a little bit. So for example, instead of connecting to uh, this machine, which was in Azure, we can go ahead and just connect to the on-premise Hyper-V for server, for example. I'm just going to publish the new version and uh, Uh, 
post a video for a little bit while it was publishing. So now it's uh, published uh, update and we can go back and try to rerun the function. We should see that it's connecting to the Hyper-V server instead of the management server. Actually on that machine, I'm not sure if PowerShell 7 endpoint is available, so it might actually fail. Yeah, yeah I think so. I can, uh, we can rather go ahead and try it against uh, the other management server, I believe, or a dom the domain controller, for example. So if we change it to, or we can just simply remove this one so it will uh, go against the Windows PowerShell endpoint. So let's go ahead and I'll just pause it while I publishing it again to say so. so now it's completed so we can go back and try to rerun it so now it will go against the de against the default windows partial endpoint and then i suppose it should work now it will also take a little bit longer time because it's a cold start after i published but here you can see as expected we are connected to the windows partial endpoint on the hyper-v host uh, next thing I wanted to do, as mentioned, was to connect to the Linux machine. So let's also try to just uh, remove the parts for connecting to the Windows machine and uh, have a look here at what we are actually doing. So if we start by uncommenting everything, I will explain it. Uh, so we start off by uh, enabling managed identity on the function. So if we go into identity, you can see that this by default turned off. So we will need to turn it on that we are going to do using PowerShell. Uh, so for that, we are going to use a key vault. So uh, this machine is pre-provisioned as you could see, it's already up and running. So I created this user account and I used SSH keygen to generate a uh, RSA key pair. So the private key is located in my local machine and the public key is on the remote machine. So basically from my local PowerShell 7 instance here, I should be able to just create a new PowerShell session against it and uh, connect to it. So here you can see that we are in fact on the remote machine, which is running CentOS. Uh, let's just go ahead and exit out of it and uh, remove the PS session. So the goal here now is to connect to the same endpoint from the function basically. So we are going to first start by creating a Azure Key Vault. This is where we're going to store our secrets. So there is a soft deleted uh, vault with the same name from my previous uh, test run. So let's just create a new one with uh, a different name. Uh, next thing we need to do is to update the access policy. So the access policy basically defines who are allowed to access secrets, create secrets and keys and so on. So this is just giving access to my the user account I am currently running under so that I can create some secrets. Uh, next we are going to enable the managed identity on the function app. So that is basically the option here that we are going to flip to enabled. Let's just also update the access policy with my user account. Uh, here we can also see that the identity option is, let's see, I'm not sure what happened there, but I just uh, restarted my PowerShell host and the function app command worked. So here basically we are just getting the function app and piping it to update AC function app and enabling the managed identity option. So let's just go ahead and run this one. So 
So now we should be able to go back here and refresh and see that it's now created a Active Directory uh, service principle with the following object ID. So this is the one that we are going to delegate some access into the key vault that we just created. So if we have a quick look here, we should see uh, the key vault. So here is the access policy. So here you can see this is only my user that have access now, but we also need to give access to the managed identity. So the function app is able to actually retrieve secrets that we put in here. So let's go ahead and grab the service principle that was created. So we need to store it in a variable in order to be able to give it access permissions. Let's just go ahead and see that we got only one. Yeah, that seems good. Uh, next, we need to add this to the name and we want to give it access to get and list both secrets and keys. So now we can see that it has action access to the things that we need. Uh, so let's go ahead and first of all add uh, the variable here called rbk password uh, as a secret. So this will be the password for the administrator account we are going to use. And what is actually rather convenient is that you can go into the secret and get this secret identifier. So it's a specific version of the secret. Copy the URI. You can go here and insert the URI into this special syntax. Uh, and this one you can actually refer directly from the function app when you go back to the configuration here. Uh, so instead of hard coding the password here, it's actually possible to go ahead and uh, uh, refer to this one as the value. So instead of hard coding it, you just refer to the key vault and it will be dynamically retrieved. So here I'm actually replacing the hard coded password with the reference to the key vault. Hit OK, save and continue. Uh, next up is the RSA key. So for this one, I'm going to convert it to a base 64 string because it's a long, very long string with special characters and so on. So it's more safe to just save it as a base 64 string to make sure that we store it and retrieve it uh, the, the exact same values basically. So here I'm going ahead and store it as a base 64 encoded string. Uh, we're going to store it as a secure string because that is what we need to specify when we use PowerShell to configure the key vault secret. So let's go ahead and update to the correct name and run this one. Now we can go back to the portal and have a quick look to see if we can actually see the new secret here. So there we see the RC key. And if you have a quick look at the secret value, you can see that it's a base 64 encoded uh, version of it. Uh, so now we can also try to just uh, retrieve it from the key vault again, because this is basically what the function are going to do. It will just call it like this. 
and then it needs to decode it so it's just grabbing the secret uh, value that we just saw and decoding it from the basic support string then we are going to and yeah, let's see it we need to of course update to the correct name here And after we have uh, done so, we are going to store it to a file because that is what we are specifying when connecting. So here I'm just using invoke command, uh, username and the keypad path, which is where we stored it here. Uh, go ahead and run it. So here I've just retrieved the partial version uh, using the private key that I retrieved from the key vault. So now I have take this is basically the same as using the local key. The only difference is that I retrieved this one from the key vault and then decoded it and stored it locally. So that is basically what the function app is, is going to do. So let's go ahead and create a new one uh, called, uh, or we can actually just reuse the same one and uh, modifying it as we are started to do here. So here you can see that uh, we are retrieving the secret from the color rect vault, grabbing just the secret value text, decoding it, storing it locally, and uh, then I think we can uh, try to run it like this actually. So we can see what happens. Let's just go ahead and comment out this for now. So I'm just going to pause and publish so we don't have to wait for that. Now it's published, uh, then we can go ahead and try to run it again. And this time it will actually not succeed and I will show you the reason. So if we go into it and try to just run it from uh, the test function in the portal. suppose this one isn't returning the information we want. Uh, so let's just go ahead and add some parameters and run it. Yeah, so it uh, returned, but there was no response because the remote uh, session failed actually. So we can't see the error message here because here we just get what is being pushed basically from this uh, push output binding command. So in order to see any errors, uh, we need to look into the logs. Uh, so that is something that we can uh, can see here. If we go into the monitor and uh, have a look at the logs. And just try to rerun it. Uh, so here we can see uh, the previous errors and uh, let's see if we can find it. Yeah, so here is the error that I'm looking for. Uh, so the exception is that the term ssh.exe is not recognized. So when you're using invoke command with the host name parameter, as we are using uh, right here, that is dependent on ssh.exe, the ssh client being uh, available and that is actually not available on the Azure Functions worker. I'm not sure why exactly, uh, probably because of some security restrictions, but uh, that is uh, unknown. Uh, so because of that, if we need to remote into Linux machines, we actually have to use our jump box. So that is why I'm going to comment this out and show you how we can use our jump box for that. So here I'm commenting out this lines. So here we are actually copying the private key using copy item and the PowerShell session that we are uh, going to establish. Let me just see uh, where that command. Yes, now I've inserted the missing piece here. So the credential object and this part which will establish the PowerShell remoting session uh, against this uh, jump box, so to speak. And here I'm also connecting to the PowerShell 7 endpoint. So we are having the option to use invoke command with the hostname parameter, basically. 
Uh, so after the copying the key, uh, we are just using invoke command uh, with the same uh, syntax that we used when testing locally, pointing to the file that we just copied. Uh, hello from the specific version and the host name and afterwards we are actually cleaning up the private key so we don't have it lingering around so we just use that as a remote jump box basically because uh, the SSH client is not available on the worker so this is kind of a worker workaround for that uh, restriction basically so let me just uh, pause and publish again and we'll test this all right so now it's published let's go ahead and run it again Wait for the cold start and hopefully see that we get a response from the Linux machine via the Windows jump box that we're using here. Nope, let's see, I'll have a quick look. Okay, so I found the reason when looking into the logs, uh, I noticed that it was unable to set the correct context when we look into the top here. Uh, that was uh, all of the demos basically. Uh, summary, uh, Azure Functions is using uh, PowerShell Core or PowerShell 7. So that's the way, uh, that's the recommendation basically for creating new uh, automation. Uh, then you have Azure Automation, which is as Windows PowerShell, which is deprecated. Uh, and we also looked at the two options for hybrid management in Azure Functions. We looked at the hybrid connections first, which requires the agent. And we then looked at the virtual network integration, which requires the premium plan, which uh, if you have set up on-prem connectivity via VPN or express route, you have the option to reach your on-prem resources as well. So from Microsoft, uh, uh, yeah, so that was my presentation. Uh, all of the co demo code and the slides will be available on this path uh, or, or this uh, URL, the GitHub repository for the conference. Uh, feel free to reach out to me either via email or Twitter if you have any questions reg regarding the session. And also don't forget to uh, mark your calendar with the, the dates for next year's conference in uh, Hanover. Thank you for watching.